Welcome to Real Conversations, exploring the meaning behind the music. Hi, I'm Reverend Jeannie Kataoka. And I'm Al Yankee. Join with us for a deep dive into the inspiration and meaning behind the music of New Thought, as important New Thought artists share the story of their creative process and their spiritual journey. Real Conversations is a rare opportunity to take a look behind the curtain to discover the connections between the stories, the music, the artists, and you. So let's dive right in to Real Conversations, exploring the meaning behind the music. We are here today with Grammy winner, Darlene Koldenhoven, and we are so excited to have her. I do believe she's our first Grammy Award winner that we've had on, and we're, we're really excited. So let's let's get this started. Al, would you like to share a little bit of background on Darlene for us? You know, Jeannie, it's it's kind of tough to know where to start or where to finish when talking about uh, Darlene Koldenhoven. She's a terrifically accomplished vocalist, a masterful pianist, a wonderful composer, and a marvelous actress. Um, knowing that I'm going to leave out a lot, let me uh, share a few highlights of her career. Darlene is the recipient of an MVP award from the National Academy of Recording Arts and Sciences as Best Studio Singer. That's for her vocal contributions to movies like Dances with Wolves, Beauty and the Beast. She's uh, contributed to television shows like Malcolm in the Middle and My So-Called Life. She's been featured on many, many albums. You hear her voice in lots of commercials in video games like Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, and in countless live performances. She's a Grammy recipient for her work as the lead soprano in Claire Fisher's 2 Plus 2 vocal jazz group. She was the featured soloist in the PBS television special Yanni, Live at the Acropolis, and in Grammy winner Ricky Kej's Shanti Samsara concerts in Bangalore, India, where they were raising awareness of climate change and animal cruelty causes. She also has a platinum album for her vocal work on Pink Floyd's A Momentary Lapse of Reason. She earned a gold album as the tambourine-waving choir nun in both of the sister act films with Whoopi Goldberg. And off-camera for those films, she was the vocal coach, vocal contractor, and the music director. She has two Telly Awards for her song and video, Love is an Action Word. Her albums have debuted or gone to number one on the ZMR radio charts and were voted by Broadcasters Worldwide Best Vocal Album for Infinite Voice and Best Holiday Album for Heavenly Peace. But she doesn't stop there. She's also an author and an educator. She uh, authored a music education book with instructional CDs called Tune Your Voice, Singing, and Your Mind's Musical Ear. She presents seminars on voice and composing for voice for music industry professionals and educators. And I repeat, I've left out a lot. It's such a pleasure. Hello, Darlene Koldenhoven. Hi, Al. Hi, Jean. How are you doing? It's so great to be here. Thank you for having me. So great to have you here, Darlene. You know, I've been a fan for quite a long time, and I think many of our listeners may not be familiar with you, but today they're going to discover such richness, such wonderful music and uh, artistic depth uh, that you bring. So uh, what I want to do is I want to go right to our first selection, and then we'll talk about it afterwards. This, uh, this is Infinite Voice from uh, 2006. So let's give a listen to Darlene Koldenhoven, Infinite Voice.
That is so great, Darlene. It's a beautiful singing and, and those lyrics, they would work in, in any New Thought Center or church. Open your heart to hear the infinite voice of love. What was your inspiration for that? I get a lot of inspiration from the higher power of the universe, God, or whatever the higher spirit is. <laughs> I truly get a lot of inspiration from that. Sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night or early in the morning with whole songs in my head. So I've been blessed with that, but I just feel it in my heart to have, it's not just, you know, it, you think, oh, I love somebody. It, it's more of a love being an action word and the infinite love of the universe and God, you know, within us that we can share and see uh, in each other if we allow ourselves that vision, you know. And so that's just kind of where I get in, inspired from to write some of my tunes and, and that one especially. Wow, that's really lovely. You know, I also uh, want to ask you about an, uh, something else. Uh, there's so much going on in that music, and I hear some very interesting instruments. I think I hear a, a duduk and uh, yes. the Armenian duduk and the Australian didgeridoo, some very otherworldly voices, mm -hmm. and the Indian tablas. Uh, it's got that easy rocking beat in seven. Yeah, and do, uh, yeah. uh, yes. So... Yeah. Uh, where did all that come from? Where does uh, mm -hmm. all that world influence come from in the music of Darlene Koldenhoven? Uh, ever since I was a kid, I was always enthralled with the instruments from other countries, you know, and uh, all my albums have, almost all my albums, not my solo piano albums, obviously, but almost all my albums have some uh, world influence, you know, some world musical instrument or some kind of scale and, and things like that. In my newest album, Traveling the Blissful Highway, there's the opening tune called Cheerful Mohana. And I wrote, that was another one of my inspired, air quotes, songs. And uh, <clears throat> I sent it to Bangalore, India, to a gentleman that I had met when I performed there, and I asked him to play the tablas and all the percussion. And then... Uh, and I also sent it to Toronto, uh, and his name was Venegopal Raju. And then I sent it to Toronto uh, for Ron Korb to play. And I met Ron through Ricky Cash also when we performed in India. Several times I've been there performing with him. That's a long plane ride, by the way, <laughs> from LA. Whew. But um, Ron, uh, so I wrote out some parts for Ron on the Bansuri, the Indian Bansuri type of flute. And then Ron improvised a regular flute part also within that. But when I sent it to to Venu in Bangalore, he said, "Wow, this is an amazing piece of music." He says, "You know, he says this is this is the Mohana. You use the Mohana." I said, "What are you talking about?" And he says, "It's a raga." And I well, I know about ragas, but I don't know that much about ragas, right? <laughs> and he said. Well, it's it's the Indian raga or scale that you know, we use in the morning, and it's called Mohana. So I therefore named the piece Cheerful Mohana. And in India, they use they play it in the morning, and they also use it to um, alleviate depression and anxiety and headaches and migraines and all kind of things. Basically, it just gets you in a good mood. So <laughs> that's why I call it. Cheerful Mohana, it was just, you know, one of those inspirations. And, and I love when that kind of stuff comes together where I'm writing something or something will come to me and somebody else will say, well, did you know that's this or that? You know, and I said, well, maybe sometimes I do. Sometimes I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to be surprised, but it's just, that's the way the inspiration comes. So, you know, I leave the doors open and what comes through, comes through. So the hmm. same way when I sing, uh, when I'm on the microphone to record the songs as well as singing live, no matter where I am or what I do, the, the last thought in my mind as I go on stage or to the mic is, okay, God, you know, tell me what I need to sing. Tell me what these people need to hear. Tell me what this audience needs. And so with that intention is how I, you know, do my music, so... 
Lovely. That's lovely. Uh, I got to pick the next song, and I picked Chromatones. Uh, I have to say, it reminded me, and, and I, I mean this as a compliment, um, I used to listen many, several decades ago, to 94.7, the wave radio station here in the Los Angeles market. And mm. they've since, since changed their programming, and so I don't listen to it anymore. But I loved that they used to play songs that sounded very similar to this. So let's um, let's listen to this, and then then we can talk about it. Okay. Thank you. 
I love the call and response between the instruments. Uh, it's and it's, it's just so so relaxing. And I think one thing that's maybe important to note here is I think to a person, everybody that we've interviewed for this show have been singers, singer songwriters, and you're the first person that we're doing songs that are just instrumentals. So that is Al was saying earlier, I don't know whether we recorded it, but that we're hoping to stretch our listeners a little bit. Uh, and then this is a perfect example of how we're going to do that. So let's, let's talk about it. Well, interesting that you, yes. So singing was my main thing, you know, from when I was three years old and uh, we'll circle back to that story. Don't let me forget. <laughs> okay. And, but I also played piano from a very young age, so I had that always going. And then, as uh, I grew, as I grew up <laughs> into my adulthood, I started, you know, composing and writing either songs with lyrics, or more and more, especially in a lot of new age music, they don't really like the lyrics per se. They really like the instrumental parts. So that's another side of me that I like to explore as well. But interesting that you mentioned you listened to the wave <laughs> because um in my new album traveling the blissful highway that tune i was just talking about cheerful mahana mm -hmm. suddenly got picked up on the wave smooth jazz station in phoenix so now oh. I have, so now i have what's known as a crossover mm -hmm. a crossover from new age music radio into a smooth jazz station in Phoenix. And they have it on awesome. deep rotation. They play it three times every day since September 29th. It's an ad, it's regular on their station now. <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, cool. I mean, who would have thought, you know, and, and, and it was unsolicited, you know, my, my radio promoter didn't talk to them. And, you know, I didn't talk to them. I mean, no, I kept asking around, did you send a tune? Did you send it? Nobody said, and then to send it to him. He must have heard it somewhere and found it and got it himself and started playing it on, on the wave. So wow. cool. <laughs> it's interesting how those kind of things work. Can you talk to us about the, the title? I don't know whether that's something you can geek out about for our listeners or the chromatones title? Yeah. Well, it's it's color. It's about the color and about this different sounds having quote different colors not exactly necessarily in this in the synesthesia effect of it you know mm -hmm. but just that sounds can create the vibration of the sound is a little different but it's like a vibration of a color and you get all these different timbres of the instruments and so it's bright and colorful which is why i thought chroma for color and tones for music so chroma okay. tones. Very cool. <laughs> you know, with the idea of chromatones um, and all the sonorities that you create in there, uh, you can tell that it's it's really very careful. Um, you create this wonderful atmosphere, this uh, kind of ethereal, active and tranquil kind of place. And the sounds that you choose, you know, I know some people will really go down the rabbit hole with uh, making their own sounds. The, the particular sonority has to be just right. Is that you? Yeah, I go all the way down the rabbit hole. <laughs> Save me. Um, but um, years and years ago, when I, I was still living in Chicago before I moved out to LA, so it was my early 20s when synthesizers just started coming out. And I had an opportunity I was at a music educators national conference that happened to be held in Chicago. And my, my bachelor's degree is in music education. So I went to this conference and there was this giant, giant synthesizer with all kinds of cords and wires. And it was the first Moog synthesizer. And I, <laughs> I was just gonna Robert ask if it was a Moog, yeah. Robert Moog. And so Robert Moog and I had this long conversation and he got me all psyched up for synthesizers. And then, and then a few months later, I happened to win a synthesizer in a contest. And wow. An ARP synthesizer. So I started experimenting. And then when I moved out, out to LA, um, I 
took classes from Clark Spangler, who was a big synth guy back in the day, and he was te teaching classes at UCLA. And I said, well, I want to learn the DX7, which is a very difficult synthesizer to program and to learn how to do. But I learned that. And then I had a Prophet 5 synthesizer, you know, and I actually had, was one of the first keytars. I had, mm -hmm. a, you know, I wore a keytar thing. And then, um, uh, uh, for the Recording Academy, Neris, I was on the Board of Governors here at the LA chapter and was also a trustee for four years and, and a chapter vice president. And I put on a, a keyboard symposium for them where we had all the different vendors of synthesizer. I had it at a and Records and all the different synthesizer vendors came. And I also made it educational for people. So I figured if people would learn more about it, like I learned about it, they'd be inspired to buy more gear, et cetera, et cetera. So Robert Moog was there, Suzanne Ciani, uh, Anthony Marinelli and Brian Banks and a few other ones, you know? And so, yeah, I go, I go way into the, mm -hmm. Nowadays, nowadays, you know, the synthesizers, you don't program them as much as, you know, you had to do back then. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes there's patches, you know, like I got myself a Yamaha motif because I like the keyboard feel, the weighted keyboard feel. And I played some kind of a patch and it was like all these different sounds in one finger, you know, and I, <laughs> I I called up a synthesizer friend of mine, uh, Brad Cole. Brad plays keyboards and music director for Phil Collins for many, many years. I said, is this legal? Can I use this? Because it's like one finger and there's a whole bunch of stuff that's already done, you know, and it mm. just felt very odd, you know, to be, and they go, no, yeah, that's what you do nowadays. It's like, oh, okay, because I need to turn all the knobs and making the soup from scratch, you know, but. So nowadays it's a little mixture of everything. You know, I get a basic synthesizer sound and if I like it the way it is, so be it. Otherwise I will layer it with other ones or else I'll do some tweaking, you know, to the filtering and layering and stuff like that. So, yeah. All right. Thank and you. I, I also still have a keytar now. I got one a few years ago, I, another one <laughs> to play live shows with this one. It's remote, you know, and it's Bluetooth, so there's no cords or wires, so you can mm. just run around stage if you want to. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could go crowd surfing with it, but I usually wear an evening gown, which makes it look more oblique, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now we're going to take a, a left turn and feature you vocally uh, in, a, in a very serious way. This is... Uh, a piece, uh, that, well, I think it's just great, uh, Emmanuel. Oh, my favorite one. What would you like people to know about this uh, before we give it a listen? This was a, Emmanuel, this was a one take performance on this one. Oh. Wow, I'm even more impressed. Yeah, it was written by Michelle Colombier. I called Michelle up, I said, I'm doing a an album and uh, do you have any songs that I could do? Cause I would sing demos for him and stuff. And he goes, boy, I would love to hear you do Emmanuel. Cause I think it was done by Branford Marsalis or something on one of his yeah. albums. And he says, I would love to hear what you do with Emmanuel. And I said, okay. So he sent me over the music and Brad Cole put the track together for me. And, and I sang it. It's like, it was one of those inspired, God, come in me, speak through me. What do you want people to hear? You know, and this is what came out. So I hope they like it. <laughs>
Wow. That is that is just gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you so much. You know, it's meditative, but at the same time, it's exhilarating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get a lot of people have told me they use it for their own healing purposes. Maybe it has to do with the way I approach it. You know, I approach it as a spiritual healing thing to begin with, you know. And I think holding that intention in mind may somehow translate through the microphone and onto the recording. But a lot, of, you know, and I, I see people weeping when they hear it. Mm -hmm. you know? it t that's the beauty of music because it opens mm -hmm. up a different place in your soul and in your physiology, mm -hmm. you know, that words can't, that music does. And when you have the addition of a human voice, even though there's no lyrics to the piece, it's the voice used to, as an instrument, mm -hmm. um, it's still the vibration that people feel. And some people need that s specific vibration. Mm -hmm. And others need it and they're not, they don't know they need it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but often they might start sleeping <laughs> and they're going, what just happened to me? Yeah. Because I I once <laughs> I was playing it I was teaching a voice class at um, a college here in town and uh, I, it was a first year uh, music appreciation class it was a course that they all had to take right mm -hmm. so I played it for them I didn't say anything about it I just said listen to this you know and I played it and about, about halfway through the thing various students in the class are 18, 22 years old. They just started crying. You know? Wow. They were like, wow, I've never felt this with a piece of music before. What just happened to me? You know, and they're very perplexed by the whole thing. And I said, that is the power of music. There might be a certain passage in a song or a chord change that all of a sudden strikes you and you go, it's just a this to that. It's no big deal. But the way it happens, and when it happens is unique. And I think that experience, you must have experienced it. I sure I I have, I, most people may have experienced that. And it's like, sometimes you, I do, I try and analyze it. And, and you can't analyze it. It cannot be analyzed. It's just one of those things that affects everybody a different way. And some people are affected similarly, but not exactly because we're all, you know, spiritual beings living in this physical body on earth and depending upon the density of our being or the lightness of our being, different pieces of music will you will choose for different reasons and they will affect you differently. And and they and you never you know, you as hard as you try, you may play or sing the same thing the same every time. But there's some little tiny nuance that changes every time you play or sing something it's never exactly mm -hmm. identical well the next one i chose and i'm i'm excited that i got to do this one um butterfly samba which Hi. was a, a single that came out a couple of years ago uh, so let's listen to it and and then talk about it okay <laughs> Flitting from a distant garden, wandering over blooming fields of clover, searching for the perfect flower to release a special power, sharing stardust stories with each other. Where did you begin your journey, or are you near my journey, or do you come alone, or with a friend? It's been the pleasure stopping by to say hello.
summer through your life just like a butterfly. Wouldn't it be nice to summer through your life just like a butterfly? Wouldn't it be nice? Everything's so nice. Wouldn't it be nice to summer through your life just like a butterfly? That is so amazing to me. And I have to ask, how does one prepare to sing lyrics that fast and <laughs> enunciate at the same time? <laughs> Very carefully. <laughs> you have to practice that. You start at a slow tempo and you work yourself up to it. You practice it, you know, faster. So, um, that's a that's a Claire Fisher tune, and uh, his son Brent Fisher, who I've known since he was thirteen, you know, uh, who's now a very grown man, you know, with kids of his own. Um, he, I said, ah, oh, you know, I'd like to do some tunes, write some lyrics to some of Claire's things, you know. And he goes, okay, cool. So he gave me, you know, Butterfly Samba, and uh, so I had it for a while. And then um, I was sitting in the backyard one day and all of a sudden some butterfly came flitting around me while I was sitting there in the yard. And just like that, the, the whole lyric just spewed <laughs> out. I happened to have a pen, uh, pen and paper in my hand at the time, you know, and all of a sudden brrr, the whole lyric just spewed right out. I mean, it was thank you, butterfly, because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> And then so he, um, so I recorded that version and then Brent also recorded it on an album of his and he used, uh, what was her name? Her last name was Gambini, I think, a, a wonderful jazz singer. And he he said to me too, she commented on, does it have to be that fast? I can barely <laughs> see the lyrics not that fast. And Brent says, what do I tell her? I said, tell her to practice it slow and faster and faster and faster and it'll come. But it does take a while to get him to come out clearly yep. that fast. So she did it well. And then she did a scat over it too. It was really kind of cool. Hmm. Fun, fun. Yeah. May was... I ask a technical question? Sure. Uh, when you're doing those those things like that, those incredibly fast things, do you move the vowels more to the front of your mouth? I was just going to say, yeah. It's very more, it's lighter. You can't put a lot of weight of the voice on it. You have to sing it lighter. And it has to be, you, there's a smile that has to happen on your face to keep the lips out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> and then the tongue has to just go really, you know, really fast. But you do have to do, you know, you have to get those facial muscles working. Mm. You know? There's exercises that we do when I teach voice to get the resorious muscles, to get those muscles around the face and lips working faster. And so, yes, it is a, it is more of a forward pronunciation. It's not in the back. It's more forward. Good observation, Al. <laughs> <laughs> well, that comes from me standing in front of the mirror and trying to do it. <laughs> <laughs> You do a lot with vocalese. In fact, I don't think anybody else currently is doing as much as you with it. Uh, are there people that uh, you look to as examples or uh, that you draw inspiration from? Uh, where you know where does your background in vocalese come from? The first time I ever ran across the term vocalese, I was in college, and my voice teacher gave me a piece. It was Rachmaninoff's vocalese. Mm. Wow, what's this? A vocalist, a piece written to sing that you don't have to memorize the lyrics? Cool. <laughs> so, so, and I just really love that idea that the voice could be used as more of an instrument because it is an instrument. It's, it's your own very personal, physical, you are your body, you are the instrument. And so that's how I got into doing the vocalese. And then um, 
when I did Yanni live at the Acropolis, that was kind of the beginning for, you know, after I did that, a lot more people were coming out with vocalese and stuff like that. But I remember at the first rehearsal we had, Yanni handed me a piece of <laughs> paper and a pencil and he goes, here, two things. He says, write some nonsense lyrics to this that don't make any sense. And also write an ending because I don't have an ending for this. <laughs> so I said, okay. So in that rehearsal, I wrote the nonsense syllables that we sang like a vocalese and, you know, what the ending was going to be like. So. And I just like to say, I, I like to do vocalese. It's really kind of cool. Um, so on the latest album, again, a lot of new age music, they like it to be more instrumental. So I snuck a few vocal things in there in the background, but used the voice in vocalese, you know, in the lyrics, um, just to be used like more of an instrumentation, you know, another instrument playing, so to speak. We have uh, quite a number of new thought musicians from around the country that listen to this show. And uh, I really wanted to choose at least one song that uh, maybe they could do, you know, something with lyrics and a form and a style that uh, that uh, might allow for someone else to sing, maybe for a service. Um, this was tough for me because I'm drawn to the more adventuresome kinds of things that you're so capable of producing, both vocally and as a composer. What I chose was Eternal Love's Song. Great choice. <laughs> Great choice for that, yes. Hear the spinning sound of love's 
that really is gorgeous, you know, that's just a, a wonderful piece. Uh, I think you'd be very proud of that. But I do have a question for you based on listening to that. Uh, when you're composing, when you're songwriting, when you're producing in the studio, uh, and you have all this capability of, of equipment and, uh, and talent and uh, ability, vocal ability, um, does it sometimes... Do you sometimes have an, uh, a quandary between being as capable and sophisticated as you can be versus simplicity? Yes and no. I mean, it seems like I'm holding myself back, but I, I just put myself in a different headspace. Um, and oftentimes, even with a lot of New Age music or New Thought music, simplicity is the key and there is a it's sometimes it can be when you have a lot of skills uh it can be difficult to hold it back you know but the idea is not to necessarily show yourself off but more to let spirit work through you and sometimes the simplest things and the cleanest things deliver one of the most profound messages too so i keep that in mind you know you know that's uh that's a different kind of sophistication <laughs> yeah it really is to to do something that's simple and not very many notes you know uh and still make it musical and still make it touch somebody that's a different kind of a skill like you said a different kind of sophistication you know but it reminds me of um, in that movie Amadeus when Salieri says to Mozart, too many notes, Mozart. You know? <laughs> so, so when I start to hear too many notes, that, that little thing always goes through my head. Too many notes, darling. <laughs> if Mozart had to hear it, so do you. So, <laughs> so the next song we're going to talk about is Radiance. So, um, Tell me about that and, and how you, you came to create that. That's on your 2021 Grand Piano Spa Legacy CD. Right. That's an interesting piece. Like Infinite Voice, I, I use odd meters sometimes. Mm -hmm. Infinite mm -hmm. Voice, seven, seven, eight. Uh, radius <laughs> is mostly in 13, eight, you know, a couple, and then, it'll, and then it has a release into six, eight, and then it goes back to 13. But that's an interesting story where the inspiration came from that one. Um, I was doing some, I, I also am a, is a, am a certified sonic therapist. And it's a kind of sonic therapy where you're listening to filtered music in various, various frequencies and types. Mostly Mozart music that has been acoustically processed to exercise the muscles of the middle ear. So when you, different frequencies um, coordinate with different parts of your body and your brain. So lower frequencies are more physical stuff. Um, middle frequencies are more for communication and higher frequencies are more for creative and spiritual. So mm -hmm. I happen to be listening to 8,000 Hertz, you know, on the headphones and it's bone conduction and air conduction headphones by then. So I was listening to 8,000 Hertz for about an hour and uh, I was done listening and I happened to come over to the piano. I put my hands in the piano and bam, this, that whole thing came out, that whole theme, the main theme just came wow. out. And I was like, my fingers, I was looking at my fingers and going, watching them play the song. I'm going, wow. so guiding my hands because it was the weirdest sensation. <laughs> I can imagine. It was strange, but honestly, that's what happened. This whole thing just came out, you know, and the whole song and there it was. And then I did, you know, some arranging to it, but the, the themes, the A themes and the B themes and all the themes that, that was all just, you know, sit back and watch your hands. Oh, wow. <laughs> It was really weird, but uh, it was really good. I enjoyed it. So yeah. oh, great. Well, and 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 my initial reaction was like because I love water, and I was like, 
this is sparkles on water. It's set yeah. to music. <laughs> so with that, uh, let's let's give Radiance by Darlene Poldenhoven a listen. Sparkles on music. I mean, sparkles on water <laughs> and music. Yeah, I. You know, I'm. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you told us that that was in thirteen because I mean, I. <laughs> I got the six eight. I got the four four. I got the uh, you know so even some hemiolas and some rhythmic shifting and stuff. But I was trying to figure out that thirteen. You know, I would have had yeah. to spend more time to get there. Yeah. 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 Have, have you seen that T-shirt with with strange times and it says these are difficult times? <laughs> yeah, my niece bought my niece. during. She sent it to me during the cold COVID. Thing. Have, yeah, I, I've thought about it because Al and I are good friends. I thought about getting one for Al. <laughs> and by the way, Al, I, I'm a big Hemiola fan. I love Hemiola. <laughs> I got introduced to hemiola in college when I, you know, Brahms had a lot of hemiola in his music, and that's where I got hip to. First of all, I was intrigued by the word hemiola. <laughs> right, it sounds like a horrible disease, you know. It does. Or somebody's last name. <laughs> <laughs> one of those, right? But, yeah, I loved it. And uh, my one of the flute players I work with, Joanne Lazaro, when we were uh, doing that song as an, as an instrumental, um, for a concert, she was playing on it, and 
She goes, yeah, you really love those hemiolas, don't you? <laughs> I go, yeah, I'm a big fan. I sneak them in every once in a while. All of a sudden, if you're not prepared, and suddenly, whoop, there's one, you know. Should we explain to our listeners what a hemiola is? No, let them look it up. Okay. <laughs> well, can you spell it for them? Let's give them a little help. <laughs> It's, it, it is like it sounds, H-E-M-I-O-L-N. Okay. All right, everybody, go look it up. All right. <laughs> Google that. Yeah, Google, Google that. that. <laughs> so we're going to move from that into another instrumental piece, uh, something uh, in kind of a different mood. This is uh, something more recent from Darlene. This is from 2022 called Gentle Soul. Thank you. 
you know, there's a phrase that uh, floats around some of these uh, new thought uh, centers that I'm at, and the, that phrase is achingly beautiful. And I think that uh, is an apt description of Gentle Soul. What a lovely piece that is. A thought does occur to me um, when I'm sitting in headphones and focused in on that and really, you know, really trying to get every nuance uh, that you've laid down with the violin players laying down. And the piece has got such a superficial um, beauty to it that... Uh, I, I think folks might might be tempted to uh, use it as background music, and I'm wondering if that bothers you at all. No, I love that idea because the stuff that seeps into the subconscious sn sneaks in there and seeps in there deeply, and so that's even better. I, I mean, if, especially if you're thinking of it on like a hypnotherapy level even, you know, it goes deep into the subconscious, you know, and so that was the effect of of, you know, to be a gentle soul, the piece is, it's fairly simple melodically, you know, and Gail Levant played some beautiful harp flourishes and Charlie Bisharet imp improvised some beautiful violin. Uh, but again, that was another one of those pieces that was just a, a first take for me. You know, I had this idea in my head and just played it in there and it was done. You know, I said, wow, this, I don't have to do anything to this. This is just, just right, you know, not too difficult, not too simple, but from the heart has a lot of warmth to it, you know, and that was the idea of the peace and the gentleness that is available to us when we take a deep breath and calm ourselves down, you know, in the soul. So I I like to do that one as like the, the uh, quiet piece, you know, when I play at New Thought Churches because I can do it as a piano solo, and then I sing the violin part with vocalese, which is kind of fun, you know? But I like to I like to do that at, at the churches too, something different, you know? The, the way I listen to, to this type of music is to let it take me where it wants to go and tell me what it wants to tell me. And at the very beginning, I thought it sounded like whale sounds. And then I went, well, the title is Gentle Soul. So of course there's whale sounds in it because that's how I, I see whales as, as gentle souls. And, yes. uh, you know, and there's a lot of uh, data of, uh, you know, stories about people, you know, fishermen saving them with, from fishing nets and, you know, and they don't fight them and they don't, you know, move their flippers or their flukes and, you know, as if they know what, what's going on. And so I, that's why I think of them as gentle souls. So that's, that's what I thought this song was about. At least that's what it was about for me. So. Good. Well, that's beautiful. <laughs> I love that. Um, the, my final choice, and we've already talked about this quite a bit, um, cheerful Mohana, and we've learned that it's, um, an Indian raga and uh, or scale and yes, that is used in the in the morning and it can alleviate anxiety and migraines um and that the radio station the smooth jazz radio station is playing it in Phoenix so um let's let's not hold it off from our re our listeners any longer and let's play cheerful mohana good
Wow, I really like that song. Thank you so much, Darlene. That's just great. Um, I do have a question, though, and it's almost as much for uh, my co-host Jeannie as it is for you. Um, I've known Jeannie quite a while and been hosting with her for quite a while, and uh, I know she's not a big fan of soprano saxophones. And when I first was listening to this at the top, I thought, well, that, you know, that it sounded to me like a soprano saxophone. But then as I listened longer, I realized, well, that's not. It's a it's a different instrument. And then I listened more and got thoroughly confused. So uh, could you help me out with uh, what the uh, kind of reedy or fluty instruments are that I've been listening to here? No, it's a it's a bansuri, b a n s u r i. It's an Indian flute. It's a bansuri flute. And then there's, and then there's some regular C flute, normal you know flute on there too. But the bansuri is one. And then my synthesizer patch is playing an interesting. Maybe that's how it it became to be played on the smooth jazz station. Maybe they thought it was a soprano. Maybe mm-hmm. I shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no, it's not? Wait a minute. (laughs) Well, we're not playing that anymore. (laughs) (laughs) That's good. So we've come to the end of our choices. So now we get to ask you, um, we we know that Emmanuel is is one of your favorites, um, but do you have any other favorite tunes or is there something you would like our listeners to hear that we inadvertently left out wisteria okay wisteria that's a really cool piece
listeners can go to my website, which is DarleneColdenhoven.com. <clears throat> if they want to uh, learn more about me as a New Thought artist and my work that I do in the New Thought churches, uh, DarleneColdenhoven.com slash spirit. And I'll spell Coldenhoven, K-O-L-D-E-N-H-O-V-E-N, DarleneColdenhoven.com. But this has been a lot of fun. Great questions, both of you. And I hope your listeners enjoyed it. Um, if they want to, if they want to get in touch with me to, for voice lessons or, or working on music or, you know, um, being part of their church service or doing vocal workshops at their church or whatever, um, please feel free to contact me through the website on the on the first page. There's a, a contact thing, and I would I love to hear from people. I respond to everything and. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and, you know, like me and follow me on social media. I hate that. It all sounds so retarded to say that. <laughs> it's part of the gig. <laughs> you know, please like and comment. So I hope to, uh, I hope to hear from y'all. I think it would be really great. So thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show. It was yeah. really lovely to be on with you. Thank you. Thank you, Darlene.